Hi everyone, my name is Yun Qing Zhou. I am Associate Professor in the Department of Special Education at Illinois State University. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about writing for publications. So I believe publication should always be the end goal of any of your work. And of course, as you are conducting research, many of us try, of course, always trying to present our preliminary results at professional conferences. But just keep in mind, conferences presentation can be a side product that should never be the end goal of your work. So I think today's target audience for this presentation, of course, include tenure track faculty members, but I think some doctoral students will find the information beneficial as well. So when I'm thinking about um, writing for publications, here are just some idea I would like to share with you. So here are just based on my own experience. So there are four key considerations uh, that lead to path to publication. So first is to know yourself, uh, know your research, and know your audience, and know your timeline. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time, talk about each of the elements, and share some of my own experience. So the very first part, of course, you need to know yourself. And the questions, um, I always remind our doctoral student or some of the earlier career faculty members, you always need to remember what are you passionate about. And uh, the reason I ask about this, I want you to think about this, is writing for publications or the journey of writing is a long process. So sometimes you can be discouraged by reviewers, sometimes you can get frustrated. And so you just need, you need something to hang on to. So for example, I'm really interested in promoting peer interactions. So sometimes it could be a reviewer's comment, um, discourage me, but all I remember is, oh, I just need to remember this is something I want to hang on to and hope to get my work out there. And the second part is, what are your strengths? So I'm talking about your strengths as a writer, but also as a researcher. So when I think about myself, I know I like to pay attention to details, maybe too much attention sometimes. I know I'm really strong with direct observation, research involved direct observation. I know I'm really good as a writer. I'm strong with organization and flow. I'm also good with APA, and my writing style is really concise. But on the other hand, statistics is never in my um, cup of the tea. So whenever I'm thinking about collaborations, and I will need Kali uh, to bring different area of the strengths. So I recently have a conversation with a Kali, and she shared with me she uh, enjoy writing about method and the results. So therefore, when she collaborate, she like to find people who write introduction and discussion. And of course, we all still have something to work on writing an introduction and discussion. So that lead to be my um, that leads to my next question. So what is your writing and collaboration style? So and specifically, I'm talking about like where and how you write the best. So when I think about myself, I like to write um, with my dual monitors. I like to write in isolated place. I also know some of my colleagues like to write in a coffee shop, or some of my colleagues like to write with a group of people, so for accountability purpose. So this is something you just need to figure out whatever the time works best for you, whatever the setting works best for you. But also, you also need to know yourself about what is your collaboration style. So of course, research takes a lot of time and work, and this essentially leads to the next point. Of course, you all have to think about collaboration. And our work, um, conducting uh, original research takes a lot of time and work. And for example, uh, for intervention study, you need uh, inter-observer reliability check. So you always need somebody there to share some responsibility with you, but also to uh, bounce off each other's idea. So when I think about my collaboration style, I think about, I share responsibility, I like to take initiative, but also think about collaboration style in terms of writing. So uh, some of those, my previous experience with some of my colleagues, we usually will each maybe takes a part of a manuscript. So for example, I might start writing an introduction while my second author is writing the method and result. And we send each other the draft and we add each other's work. 
So sometimes you just need to know people who you'd like to work with, and over the time, you probably will learn who you may or may not work with. So that's just something you kind of need to find out on your own. And so I do want to come back to the idea of, about like why collaborate. So in the field of special education, of course, we the original work require a lot of time and effort, so we collaborate. But I also think about collaboration actually brings out diversity. Um, I think diversify your idea, diversify your research method, diversify your expertise is really the way to substand uh, your research work. And later I'm going to share with you some of my work and actually uh, from collaboration with some of my colleagues, I learned to I in, basically enhance my knowledge and actually extend my scope of work. So the second part is to know your research. So um, some of those common mistakes I guess we all made is, what, I guess we sometimes we narrowly define ourselves as um, the type of research. Um, we define our research by research method and that's something I sometimes I do. I might introduce myself, say, hey, my name's so-and-so and I like to do single case research. But you should always, always start with your area of interest because you start with your area of interest and lead to what a specific research question you want to answer and then you find out whatever the most appropriate research method that can answer your research question. So that's why I, for, my, for example, I am interested in promoting peer interaction and of course I would like to um, conduct intervention research to try to establish functional relations between student outcome, specifically peer interaction and intervention. But at the same time, I also, I'm also interested, I'm interested in other type of work that can also promote social interaction as well. And um, a lot of the time, um, I think people might have a different type of approach in terms of when they try to interpret their own research. So it could be broad, so you could be doing a lot of different type of research and related to one specific population, or you can be narrowly just focused on one type of um, the method. And for example, like qualitative work, focus on people's perspective. And so I think either way really depends on how you want to be known um, in, in your field. So know your research, this is, I think know your literature, this is really part of this question I, I encourage you, everybody should always ask yourself. How or what do you want to be known for in your work? So this is really key part, of course, you need to know the background, you need to know the gap in the literature, you need to know where and how you can contribute but this is the question is of course this is going to define what type of work you will be doing and where you're going to find the journal or where you're going to find the audience to disseminate your work so i would like to share with you a little bit about my own work as an example so I am really interested in promoting, of course, peer interaction, specifically uh, social interaction among students with and without disability in um, inclusive uh, classrooms. So my initial work, actually starting from my doctoral program, I start with um, doing a systematic review. And I also, as a part of my doctoral program, I conduct observational studies. So these two research projects actually lead to uh, my dissertation, which was intervention study. It's a single case study that I work with a peer professional, I work with the peers, and promote interaction for students um, who use communication devices in the general education classrooms. So later, uh, when I start to become a uh, assistant professor at ISU, I collaborate with a colleague. Uh, thanks to Dr. Karen Douglas, uh, we replicate my dissertation. So we work with the, some of the local um, uh, school close by, and we work with students 
uh, with paraprofessionals, working with the students who use communication devices, and we provide training to a paraprofessional and increase some of the social interaction of a student in the gender education classrooms. So as a result of that, we kind of compile with my prior experience. So we actually later publish our work in a teaching exceptional jo uh, journal. So this is actually a practitioner journal articles. And this is where this graph is coming from. I share some specific strategies with teachers. And later, I also reach out to another colleague, uh, Dr. Julie Stoner, and her research area was on um, communication. So we conduct a review specifically uh, focusing on um, studies, qualitative study uh, involved in educational teams supporting the students who use a communication, a AC augmentative and alternative communication. So that was reviewed, uh, we conducted and we published. And uh, later I also, I was reached by one of the, the colleagues at Alzheimer University, uh, Dr. Enzik, and we published the work on her, one of her observational study. Uh, also very similar to one I conducted before on communication opportunity for students we use uh, AAC in basically in the, across the school settings. So because inclusion has continued to be the core value that drives my work. So I also work with another colleague, the Dr. Walker, and we published this work, um, a meta-analysis, a systematic review and we reviewed our functions-based interventions specifically for students with disability and inclusive school settings. So I just want to show you this example in a way, of course, some of my earlier work, primarily just between myself and my advisor, but later I found out as I start collaborating with colleagues, and I get to experience different type of research method because actually as a result working with Dr. Stonert, I learned more about qualitative research, how to interpret the result, and actually currently I'm working with Dr. Walker on her, one of her, her research projects, and we're trying to disseminate results on qualitative research. So, we talk about you need to, of course, know yourself, you need to know your research, but the, 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 the fundamental purpose, of course, to disseminate the work is to know your audience. And a lot of the time I like to think about myself as a self person, because um, I think as educational researcher, uh, dissemination is basically, is part of a, is required and is necessary because this is how the scientific community continue to grow and move forward. So when I think about how you're going to disseminate work, how you're going to disseminate your work, and even justify the significance, the purpose, the importance of your work is definitely a key skill we all need to have. So that leads to our next point is you have to know your journals. And there are many journals out there, and all the journals are created equal, of course and you need to know what are the journal scope, what are the journal's target audience, do they have any particular style they require, and one of the really good way I would recommend it to get to know the journal, of course, you go to the website, you see what kind of, what kind of scope, they, what kind of work they usually publish, you can see what are the most recent publication, but another good tip I will definitely suggest you to do is serve as reviewers. So survey reviewers of the journal actually allowed you to get to know in and out of the journal is about. So I was actually in the journal, the reviewer for AAC, Augmentative, Augmentative Alternative Communication as a journal. And from reviewing for the journals, I get to learn, of course, you see in the comments from other reviewers, you get to see uh, the editor's comment, and you get to see what type of work being submitted to the journal, and it's really helpful And because later I submit my work to the journal and was able to get published. So, so that's just some good ideas. So survey review for the journal is going to help you uh, get to know the journal. And of course, every journal has a 
own direction. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but you definitely want to make sure you follow the guidelines of the whatever the journal, the manuscript. There's always requirements specific, so you should always follow the direction very carefully. And one thing about dissemination is you always have to write clearly and concisely because they always have a page limit, of course. Reviewers' times are precious and um, the journals only have a certain resources to publish, so we want to make sure we write clearly and concisely. So I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about following the directions. And a lot of the time this idea might seem really simple, but sometimes it's some of those really basic ideas and people miss, and you miss opportunities to get published. Sometimes just a very simple, just the format, how they like to format your, your manuscript, and sometimes really small thing might even delay the process of the dissemination. The size of font, uh, the writing style, and of course, we know many journals in the United States use APA, but sometimes they might or might not be the case for international journals, so you make sure you know about that. A page limit, this is very, very critical, and does the page 30 page, uh, 30 page limit include the cover page, include your tables, and so those are things you need to make sure um, you are aware. Of. Um, so one thing I always learn is, of course, um, people have a different perception about APA, but um, but if I, as a reviewer, so if I'm reviewing manuscript and if it's starting from page one and I notice the author has made a lot of multiple errors about APA and sometimes that that is that can be quite concerning. So that's why I'm talking about even as basic as APA, you want to make sure you follow the APA throughout and to show that you really put your effort into your work because you don't want this, again, it could be something really basic but going to compromise your work. And I always like to think about dissemination as salesperson. You, it's almost like you are trying to present, you're trying to sell your work. You, you are presenting your work to people either in and outside your principle. So this is almost like you always have to write from the perspective of your reviewers, of course. Reviewers are always right. But you always have to write in the perception of your audience. So I think about one of the, the things I always try to work on is you, you always have to try your best to use a simple language to explain big or complex ideas. In one of my writing style, I like to use simple sentences. And of course, if one sentence is if one sentence is over like four or five lines on your basically word document, and that could be something you want to divide into at least two sentences. And one thing you always want to do, of course, use headings. And this is I told my students always uh, it's good tips. So use your organization because when you are writing with your audience in mind, you are using headings, you're using paragraph structure. Uh, to guide your readers. So again, whenever you have a long paragraph, you always want to break down into multiple shorter paragraphs, but sometimes even just use the transitions, use some of the organization like first, second, and third, and those some, some type of structure is going to make it easier for your readers to follow what you're going to present. So the last part is to know your timeline. And of course, you want to get your work uh, published as quick as possible because you don't want something is after two or three years and almost by the time you have to redo your introduction, you need to redo your literature review. So almost like, so by saying that, this is almost kind of requires some backward planning. So we are thinking about usually the journal, um, usually timeline about, depends on the journal, it's about a year, a year and a half. And whenever you submit a journal article, usually of course take about two months. So this is a time you really need to plan carefully about oh, when am I, I'm going to submit in January. So by the time I get the feedback, would I be able to uh, turn around quickly or do you want to submit something in the mid? like March and hopefully get it back during summer, you have more time to work on review. So this is just something you need to be 
aware, and this is actually going to come easier once you get to know your journal, because every journal, of course, has a different a timeline. And sometimes, of course, timeline could be also changed depends on the editor. So, of course, you need to know is this particular journal, they change the editor. So sometimes they might take a longer for some journals and then the others. Uh, so um, let's talk a little bit about feedback. And of course, as a part of a peer review process, we are going to get the feedback. And most of the time, of course, constructive feedback. So think about from reviewers' perspective, they are doing, they are review our journal article, they are review our manuscripts, uh, based on using their own time. So of course, they expect us to respond to the feedback. So, so one thing I always um, share with my colleagues, even remind myself, is do not get discouraged. So um, all the journal articles, all the manuscripts, will find its home. So just do not get discouraged. Sometimes the first time you get the feedback, could be a reject, could be a rejection, could be revise and resubmit with four pages, like a single space, comment, revision, but do not get discouraged. So I usually, what I like to do is, when I get the feedback, I just look at that and take, take a deep breath and put away for maybe two or three days or a week and go back again. But once you get the feedback, and once you in the process revision, make sure you respond to each single feedback, including the reviewer's feedback, the editor's feedback. Of course, you always try to change whatever you can. And sometimes, um, I do want to remind you, is sometimes actually the changes might not be as significant as you thought, because could be, um, the reviewers a question about one particular citation. So it could be just add one citation or change one sentence introduction versus the entire paragraph. And of course you want to change, you want to be responsive, but at the same time you also need to stand up. You can also need to stand up for yourself um, when you believe um, you are doing the right thing. So for example, there was one time I conducted a review and the reviewers um, disagree with our evaluation for that one of a particular article, but we just respond with, this is what we did, we respectfully disagree, and then we explain to the editor. So, but again, just remember, always, always respond to the feedback. And that's really, a lot of time, there's no shortcut when you think about publication. So once you know your timeline and what you need to do is you write, you write, you revise, and you write more. So ideally, if you think about the timeline, it's usually um, a year and a half for one manuscript to get published. So almost you want to always have something, you are collecting data, you have something under review, and you have something you are in final process, either revise and resubmit. So again, you won't have a multiple writing products going on at the same time. So this is actually lead to another of uh, the resources here. And this is a book I um, people share with me earlier in my doctoral program is how to write a lot. So this is almost writing from the behavior approach. So think about how you can be productive. So it's just one resource and going back to again, you need to know yourself and know your writing style. So here is my really brief um, <laughs> uh, tips about uh, writing for publication. So please feel free to contact me if you have any questions, any comments. Um, if you have any projects, you, will, you are looking for co-authors, I'm always open to writing opportunities. So you can see here is my email, and feel free to contact me.